this is bloody well awesome. Um, I'm looking down at Dawson City. Uh, and in the backdrop is the Yukon River. And if you see the clear water flowing in here where it meets the silted water of the Yukon, that would be the, um, the Klondike River. And this was an area that nobody had any interest in. They saw no potential. It was too remote uh, until August the 16th, uh, 1896, when a fellow by the name of, um, let's see, we had George... Um, George Carmack, Skokum Jim, and Charlie Dawson find gold on, at that time it was called Rabbit Creek, and later it was named El Dorado Creek. And uh, once word got out to the outside world, well, all of a sudden this area was important. And uh, I'm going to talk uh, today, I'm going to be touring uh, the city itself, some of the historic buildings, and talking a wee bit about it, the history of the gold rush of 1896-97-98 and uh, it's a fascinating tale and, and unlike a lot of um, other historic sites that are reconstructed um, this is the real McCoy. I mean these are the same buildings I'm going to be walking on the same boardwalks leaning against the same bars that the miners uh, stood at when they brought in their poke of gold and had their pint of beer and I'm going to be leaning on that bar having myself a tankard here shortly. Anyway. I'm going to take you on a tour of a fascinating um, bit of Canadian history. So I'm down off the dome and I'm standing right at the, at the confluence of the uh, Klondike River and the Yukon River proper. Um, just, just a bit of information of how Kathy and I are going to organize and coordinate this trip. It's a linear trip, so we're starting in Whitehorse coming up here to Dawson City. And anybody that's done any canoeing knows sometimes the logistics of that can be a little complicated. So we've left our canoe and gear and white horse at a friend's. We've driven the car seven hours up here to Dawson City yesterday. We've made arrangements with the Tourist uh, Information Center to park it for a few weeks. Tomorrow we get on a bus back to White Horse, another seven hour drive. And um, day after tomorrow we start the river. This is a classic example of, uh, of buildings or structures that were built uh, on permafrost. So these are original structures, as are many of the ones we're photographing today. Um, but if they're not maintained and constantly adjusted as the permafrost freezes and thaws, you get a four-sided building that soon has six or eight sides to it. So yeah, these guys look like they're perhaps beyond repair, which is unfortunate. So Kathy and I are actually at the home of Robert's service, and it's not recreated. This was the actual cabin that the most popular poet of the 20th century wrote his works, with such lines as, there are strange things done in the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. It is a, he's always been one of Kathy's and my favorite po po poets, so it's a, it's a, it's quite an honor to actually stand where, where those works were written. I can, uh, I can never tire of this. We've got, uh, I'm sitting in front of another famous author. So Jack London's recreated um, cabin here. Now they did use um, a few of the logs in this reconstruction were actual logs that were salvaged from his original cabin. Now, he came here to prospect, he didn't come here to write. <laughs> he, was, he was hungry for gold like everyone else, gonna get rich quick. Anyway, he didn't take to that prospecting much. He got scurvy and he makes his way back to California. But he writes such famous books as uh, The Call of the Wild, White Fang, and To Light a Fire. And if you've never read any of his books, you should give it a try. But To Light a Fire is my personal favorite. It is a gut-wrenching book that will bring out every emotion you ever, ever knew you had in it. Uh, yeah, so a typical cabin of that period, uh, sawed roof was very common, hand hewed, they often squared the ends of the logs and, and did their notching in a square basis versus round, so quite typical of the construction of the time. This is the spot 
this is the very spot that uh, they discovered gold in the Yukon. Uh, yeah, so we're on the Bonanza Creek, which is a tributary of the of the um, Klondike, and the only this is the second richest deposit of gold they ever found. Uh, the the richest was another tributary they called the El Dorado, but initially this was called Rabbit Creek by the natives. And anyway, this is it. This is where it all started. It's it's pretty neat. Most of this was placer gold, so. It was easy to mine. Most of it was on the surface or just barely into the gravel. Uh, unlike as time progressed, in order to get the gold, they had to do a whole lot more work with dredges and sluice and, and what have you. But all right, it all started here. So a lot of people made it rich in the gold rush and some people didn't make a penny. But a fellow who made a whole lot of money, uh, his name was Joe Ledoux. And he, wa he was a prospector turned outfitter because he realized he could make a whole lot more money mining the miners and mining the soil. So while everybody was up there staking their claims on the El Dorado and the Bonanza, he was down in the flat staking the city of Dawson, and uh, or Dawson City. And uh, a lot of people thought him crazy. They were moose flat, swampy, infected, mosquito infected areas. So he builds a sawmill because he knows they're going to need wood for sloughs. He knows they're going to need wood for cabins. He builds a bridge across the Klondike River and he charges people a, a fee to walk across it. Uh, he builds the first house and, uh, and until they can get hotels built, it, it substitutes as a, for a secondary purpose as a saloon. Uh, within six months, there's 500 houses in Dawson. And a plot of land this size would bring about, if someone was going to put a wall tent on it, would bring $500 on the poor side of town, on the other side of the Klondike. If it was a corner lot, it would bring 20000 If it was a front street lot, it would bring $40,000. His net worth, they claim on paper at least, at the, end of the, uh, at the end of the gold rush was about $5 million in 1898 money. So my wee bit of history wouldn't be complete unless I explained how people got here. We're very remote, we're just south of the Arctic Circle. There were two major points. One was at Dai, where we had the Chilliput Pass. The other was Skagway, where we had the White Pass. White Pass was not as steep and not as long, but it was fraught with problems. And it became known as the Dead Horse Pass and was ultimately closed because of uh, problems with it. So that left the, the uh, Chilliput Pass. And if we look across the Yukon River at this height of land over here, that is pretty representative of the height and the steepness of the Chilliput Pass. So it would take a, a prospector about 40 trips uh, because the RCP at this time had passed a law that they had to bring one ton of gear. 1,150 pounds of that had to be food supplies. They were afraid of, of famine in the Dawson City area. And it was burgeoning. Um, as many as 30,000, some say as high at 50,000 at times. So 40 passes, take them about three months, and they'd travel about 2,000 kilometers. They could hire packers. So again, we have people mining the miners who would carry your gear for you for a dollar a pound. Uh, in today's dollars, that'd be $27 for every pound they put on their back to haul up the Chillicoot Pass. But it's not over when they get there. RCMP weigh your gear, they say, you're good to go. Now you've got to drop down into British Columbia um, to Bent Bennett Lake. And at Bennett Lake, you've got to build a boat. <laughs> And then you got to get on the same river that Kathy and I are going to be on in two days and paddle 800 kilometers to Dawson City from Bennett Lake. Uh, now the boats aren't seaworthy, a lot of them. A lot of people are dying. So the RCMP again step in and they introduce a law that says number one is the boats have to be inspected, make sure they're seaworthy. Two is no women or children were allowed to traverse rapids. And number three is they had to have a licensed pilot pilot the craft. Uh, it saved thousands of lives because it was at that time a very treacherous river, still is in points. Um, anyway, that's how they got to Dawson City. Uh, and like I said, I have just barely touched on a little bit of the history that happened here in not a very long period of time, but a fascinating part of Canadian history.